we've studied verses 1 through 8, so we will read now Acts 1. We're actually going to read the entire rest of Acts 1. So Acts 1, beginning in verse 9 and through verse 26. When Jesus had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, a keldo. Akeldama, that is, field of blood. Now we return to Peter's speech. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from, among, from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles." This section of scripture is uh, a little bit unusual for us, a little bit unusual for me to try to preach. It's unusual because we've already studied most of the major themes here. Uh, beginning of the year, we spent several sermons on the second coming. Last Sunday, we talked about the ascension. In October and November of 2014, I preached uh, seven or eight sermons on Judas, both the story of his life and death, as well as the connection between Judas and Bible prophecy. Um, and then finally, in our current series and in the series before this, we've spoken about the qualification and role of apostles. Um, so there's a lot here that we, we don't really need to cover the ground again. So what, do, what does that leave, with, for, leave for us from the end of Acts 1? What it leaves us with is a, a beautiful and compelling portrait of a group of people who had been prepared to wait for the Lord. Jesus himself had been getting them ready for these days, preparing them for this moment. He promised the Spirit, but then he ascended to heaven, leaving them to wait for the fulfillment. So these were, these were the days between the promise and its fulfillment. Now remember that they did not know how long that time frame would be. Back in verse 5, it says, not many days from now, which means soon but as you all, you all know, what God means by soon and what we mesh, wish he meant by soon don't always line up. And so they did not know how long it would be. The Feast of Pentecost was coming up, but they didn't have any idea that the Spirit was going to be given on the Feast of Pentecost. So they were waiting. And this is compelling for us because we too are people who live in the days between the promise and its fulfillment. We could say that in the grand sense that we are people who are waiting for the promise of the return of the Lord Jesus, the promise we just read. But even right down into the details of our lives, we are so often waiting, waiting for the answers to the prayers we've prayed, waiting for the trial to end, 
waiting for the word to do its work, waiting for the Lord's provision. And so I've called this how to wait on the Lord. These first Christians may have had a lot to learn in the days and weeks and months and years ahead, but Jesus had prepared them well to understand the essentials. And what's striking to me is how easy it is for us to neglect the same essentials that Jesus had prepared them to understand. So how do we wait on the Lord? Let's pray for just a second and then look at these things. Father, we wait on you now, waiting in confident expectation that your word doesn't return void, but you accomplish with it what you please. So what is it that you want to accomplish this morning? We don't know. We're the ones who bring the needy hearts that need to be fed. And we come with the confidence that we have a father who knows exactly what it is that we need. And so we, we wait, wait in anticipation that you're going to feed our, our souls. We're not just like hungry people who need to eat, however. We're also like soils to receive the seed of the word. And we can be hard soils. And so we come and pray because we don't want to be. We want to be soft, fertile soil where your word lands and grows and produces fruit. So soften us if need be this morning. Draw us back to the basics of following Jesus. Help us to wait on you well. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. How to wait on the Lord. Number one, wait together. Wait together. See verse 12. They returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Ovet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. I know that a Sabbath day's journey sounds like a day-long journey, but what that means is the distance that the rabbis said you were allowed to travel on the Sabbath without breaking the law. And so that was a very short distance. It was just enough to get you across your village, so about three-quarters of a mile. Um, but that's all it took to get from the Mount of Olives, which is on that slope right across the Kidron Valley outside of Jerusalem, back into the city. So verse 12 says, they return to Jerusalem. They probably means the apostles. And the end of verse 13 lists them. There are 11 here without Judas Iscariot. And this list is similar to the list in the book of Luke. The really significant change is that Andrew is moved later so that Peter, James, and John can be at the beginning of this list, and Peter and James and John are the only apostles mentioned in the rest of the book of Acts. Peter will be the initial leader of the church in Jerusalem. Later, James, the brother of Jesus, will rise to the forefront. But the point here is that the 11 apostles returned to Jerusalem together. Does that strike you as good news? Do you remember what they did before? Everybody scattered on the night of Jesus' death. Everybody ran in fear. Satan tried to sift them like wheat, but Jesus prayed that their faith would not fail and then graciously restored them. On the night before he died, Jesus had spoken about them to his father and he said it like past tense, as if it was already over and he knew what he was gonna do. Here's what he said. He said, Father, I kept them. I have guarded them. And not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. That is a remarkable past tense because it was still in process. It was right in the middle of the heat of that battle. And yet Jesus said, I kept them. I guarded them. Despite all their struggles and their weakness and their great failure, here in Acts 1, after the resurrection and ascension, here they stand, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm using the words a little bit out of context, but I think of those words in Romans 15. Here they stand because the Lord is able to make them stand. Weak sinners like us stand in the grace of the Lord. So here they are, brought back together, restored by Jesus. They return to Jerusalem. Verse 13 says that they went up to the upper room. The upper room would have been a room on the roof uh, of these homes in ancient Jerusalem. It sometimes was, was kind of like an apartment rented out to tenants, but oftentimes it was a, um, a, a leisure room uh, by, owned by wealthier families. It'd have an external stairway up to get into it and would be a place to get up above the hustle and bustle of the streets to enjoy the Mediterranean breezes in the evenings. Um, 
it, though it's not the same, what I picture when I think of an upper room is I picture if, if some of you have a large backyard that's somewhat secluded so you don't have neighbors looking right in on you like some of us have, it's a place to just breathe. That's kind of what these upper rooms were, were like. And, um, but does that phrase upper room get your attention? Was this the upper room? Uh, grammatically, that's what it says, though the word is not the same word used for the place where the Last Supper took place, the place where resurrection appearances took place, but they're synonyms. It could be the place. How meaningful would that have been to come back to the place of that Last Supper together with Jesus, to come back to the place where many of them saw Jesus for the first time? I don't know, but it's possible that it's that upper room. But regardless, this large room means that some wealthy follower of Jesus was eager to use his or her property for the Lord. And it was unusual to find such a sizable place where people could gather privately. It had to be sizable because the apostles gathered with many other followers of Jesus. We're going to look at this in reverse order, starting in verse 15. The end of verse 15 says, The company of persons was in all about 120 120 followers of Jesus gathered together. And that's a lot of people to cram into an upper room, um, even at a very large house. But have you ever seen pictures of persecuted Christians around the world who can't meet publicly crammed into a place? Because they're just glad to have some place to meet and pray and worship together? How small of a space could you fit 120 people into if you were just glad to be able to gather with your brothers and sisters in Christ and pray? Uh, and so it's, it's a reminder to us, whatever the situation was here, and it, it, it's possible there are other explanations, like that there was a courtyard and other things they were using too, but it reminds us that followers of Jesus don't have to have fancy buildings and coffee bars and lounge chairs to gather. It's, it's Jesus that, that unifies us, not our, our comfy place to hang out. Now, does this mean there were only 120 followers of Jesus at this point? And I, I think almost certainly not. Remember that after the first resurrection appearances, Jesus sent the disciples back up into Galilee. The majority of his resurrection appearances seem to have happened there, there and we're told that he appeared to more than 500 at once. So there are probably many other followers of Jesus up in Galilee who are working, who are farming, who can't come spend this time together with the others in uh, Jerusalem. But here we have this 120. Now, this 120 was about to experience some startling change. And it makes me think of when a new baby is added to one of our earthly families, and we talk about how the brothers and sisters are going to have to adjust. You've gotten downright comfortable to being the only child, and it's about to change. You're going to be one of two now. Or you got comfortable with one child for mom and one child for dad, and now you got three, and the whole thing changes. Things in the home won't ever be exactly the same again. And that's hard because sometimes the children liked it the way it was. Well, for these Christians, in the next two weeks, their group of 120 would add thousands of babies thousands of followers of Jesus in two weeks. It was a short pregnancy. <laughs> Not a lot of time to prepare. Did they like it the way it was with 120? Well, I don't know, but what do you think the answer is? Probably yes. Probably this was a pretty tight-knit group of people. Many of them had been disciples who had followed Jesus for years. They loved each other. They knew each other. They'd been... I think you know what I mean when I say this? They've been camping together, camping together for years, right? But Jesus had bigger purposes. His gospel was supposed to go to every person. And so in the days ahead, these 120 had to be ready to learn an incredible flexibility to welcome all those whom the Father would save. And so let us have that same attitude. I... I, two weeks ago, I was at a church in Washington and uh, they have uh, pews and I walked in and all over those pews were scattered people's pew cushions with their spot. And some of those people have sat in that pew cushion in that spot for many, many years. 
And so you, you asked the question. It just made me ask the question about our church too. What would happen if our pew cushions got moved over? What would happen if we, if we tripled the number of people we had to fit in the place? And some people had to be out in the hallway watching on a monitor out there and not everybody could be as comfortable and there weren't as many snacks as there used to be. You know, there are those strawberry brownie things out there today. Wouldn't it be a travesty if there were 500 here this morning and only 50 strawberry brownie things out there? (laughs) Are you ready to welcome each new person the Lord brings, even if it changes the grace group that you are comfortable with? You like that group? Even if it changes the way the class used to be or the way the church family used to be? Jesus' disciples are or should always be anticipating new opportunities to bring others into the body of Christ. We should expect it to always be changing. It can never, ever be us four and no more. We like our little comfortable church. Oh, may it never be. God can do what he wants. God takes care of the numbers. None of that is our concern. Our heart is to have his heart, right, for people. So, 120 that was about to grow to thousands. Besides these apostles, who else was among these 120? Well, let's keep working our way backwards. The end of verse 14 says, Jesus' brothers were part of the 120. Now, throughout church history, there have always been those who wanted to teach the perpetual virginity of Mary and Joseph. And so they have tried to argue that these weren't literally Jesus' brothers. But there is no indication, either in the Gospels or in Acts, that we should take this to have some sort of obscure meaning other than its plain meaning, which is that these were Jesus' brothers, the children of Joseph and Mary, three sons who are named in uh, the Gospel of Mark. These were the brothers who, even late into Jesus' public ministry, refused to believe in him. As of the time of the crucifixion, we have no indication that his brothers have changed from their original perspective, which is, you are crazy. You are out of your mind. But somehow, God brought them to faith in Jesus. Maybe through the crucifixion, maybe through the resurrection. We only have one clue. Paul tells us that Jesus appeared to his brother James after his resurrection. Maybe his other brothers too, we don't know. But apparently all three of his brothers became his followers. And what I love is that there's no indication that they set themselves apart as some special group. Yeah, you're a follower of Jesus, but I am a brother of Jesus. You know, you could see how we would all kind of naturally tend toward that attitude. But instead, they just joined together with the rest of the disciples. And I can hardly imagine how meaningful it must have been for everyone to have Jesus' brothers there. Because they had been there when Jesus' brother said, you're out of your mind. And now here they are gathering with them. It's a beautiful thing. And then just before this in verse 14, we read that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. Now again, throughout church history, there have been attempts made to exalt Mary to some special place, even as a co-redeemer with Jesus, as the Roman Catholics dare to assert. But here we find the last mention of her in the New Testament, and she's simply gathering with the other disciples of Jesus. She was his mother, and that was not what was most important. She was a believer, and she was a follower. And having had her heart pierced through by the agony of the cross, what a joy it must have been for her to watch the events that unfolded at Pentecost and beyond that. What a joy it must have been for her to watch her sons come to faith. What a joy it must have been for the other disciples to gather with her. Can you imagine? All right, break up into your groups and pray. Who gets to pray with Mary today? So among the 120 were the apostles, were the brothers of Jesus, then Mary, the mother of Jesus, and then in the middle of verse 14, who do we have? The women. The women. In a culture where women were occasionally powerful and important, usually sidelined as insignificant, it is very meaningful that Luke wants to point out to you the women. Now, doesn't it sound like you're supposed to know who these women are? the women. And the reason for that is because you're supposed to have read the Gospel of Luke first. And so these are the women that you already learned about in the Gospel of Luke. The women, many women, it says in Luke, some of whom had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, 
who followed Jesus together with the 12 and were part of the financial funding that provided for the group. These women were there at the crucifixion when nearly all of the men had fled. And these women were the first witnesses to the resurrection. In the book of Acts, Luke will be careful to point out that the Spirit was poured out on the men and the women. He'll point out that men and women were saved and baptized, that men and women were dragged off as Christ- to prison as Christians. We'll learn about Lydia, who was saved in her household with her. In Thessalonica, many leading women joined Paul and Silas as believers. So did a woman named Damaris in Athens. Aquila and his wife Priscilla became co-workers with Paul. And remember, they taught Apollos the way of God more accurately. Philip, the deacon and evangelist, had four daughters who prophesied. And so in Luke and in Acts, the women flourish as followers of Jesus. Yes, God teaches certain roles and responsibilities that differ for men and women. The apostles were men chosen by Jesus. Yet in Christ, women are equally heirs of the Spirit, discipled, gift, disciples, gifted, persecuted, and just as important to the body of Christ as the men. The church of Christ will never flourish without female disciples who are flourishing as they follow Jesus. So among the 120 who gathered to wait, Luke wants to make sure you know about the apostles, the brothers of Jesus, the mother of Jesus, and the women. Now let's not lose sight of the general point that as they waited, they gathered. It's always God's plan for his people. Jesus' first followers knew they were supposed to be family. And the same's true for you. You're not supposed to suffer alone. You're not supposed to grieve alone. You're not supposed to face temptation alone. You're not supposed to serve alone. You're not supposed to learn alone. You're not supposed to have to rejoice alone. And certainly when we're in those difficult times that test our faith, those times when we are waiting on the fulfillment of God's promises, we're not supposed to wait alone either. One more part of the text we shouldn't miss in this regard is in verse 14, the beginning words, all these with one accord. With one accord. They were acting as one. They were united with the same love and with the same goals. See, their new goals were not the goals of individual achievement and rugged individualism. Their new goals were about the family of Christ. And we may share various things in common with other people, but there should be no unifier like our love for Jesus. When we set aside our own agendas, we find oneness in God's agenda. And no matter our personal differences, Jesus brings us together with one accord. So how do we wait on the Lord? Number one, wait together. Now verse 14 continues, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. So number two, wait in prayer. We're not going to focus on prayer here this morning because we'll have many more specific examples to study later. Peterson writes that it is striking that at almost every important turning point in Acts, we find a mention of prayer. Custer writes, this prayer here in Acts 1 is going to start a cycle that runs all through Acts. Prayer, power, proclamation, persecution, more prayer. Prayer, power, proclamation, persecution, more prayer. You see that the verse says they were devoting themselves to prayer, persevering, keeping at it, continually coming back to God in prayer as they waited. You know, when I'm waiting on the Lord, what tends to happen is that I get all caught up in the swirl of my own thoughts about the situation but my swirling thoughts won't fix anything. So there is a certain discipline. There is a certain careful focus that is necessary to remain devoted to prayer. Remember Paul says to the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. What does that mean? Don't stop even though it's easy to give up on praying. So number two, when you're waiting, wait in prayer. Now would you turn with me to Luke chapter 24? Remember that Luke 24 and Acts 1 overlap. They tell us uh, additional descriptions of the same events. And so 
We want to make sure we add this from Luke 24 into our understanding of Acts 1. Luke 24, verse 51. While Jesus blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. So, number three, wait in worship. Putting this together with Acts 1, what it seems likely was happening was something like um, during the day when the temple was open, the disciples were there praising God, worshiping God. And then maybe mornings or evenings, they would gather in the upper room to pray. And then it's highly unlikely that they were actually staying there, all 120 of them. They probably had their own lodgings that they returned to at night. So uh, this was a bit like the old Bible conference days of uh, 19th century America. When you go travel somewhere, stay somewhere, and have these different times of teaching and, and praise and other things together, they were worshiping God in the temple during the day and then gathering in the upper room to pray so, so what do we learn from this worship? Two pretty different lessons. First, we learn that they believed that Jesus was God. Their first response when he returned to heaven was worship. Now, the nation of Israel had a long national history of idolatry. But because of that idolatry, the Jews in the first century were especially passionate about not worshiping anyone except the one true God. That's part of the reason why they were so upset about Jesus. And so now for these Jews to worship him means for them to say, this has to be God. This has to be Yahweh, the one true God. So the first thing we learn is that they believed he was the one true God. But the second thing we learn from this is that we need to worship when we're waiting. When things are uncertain and, and we're trying to trust God to keep his promises even though we can't see it and we're saying, how long, O oh Lord? That we need to make sure we don't stop worshiping. We can get bogged down in our suffering. We can get bogged down in our praying. But we were created to enjoy God and worship him. We are not supposed to survive without worship. It's, it's in our DNA as human beings. Living without worship, like trying to receive help and grace and strength from the Lord without then returning it in worship to him is like trying to live on just what you breathe in without ever breathing out. And so we are created for worship. This January, I uh, threw out my old prayer list and I started over. And couple changes I made when I started over. One was I, I took my gratitude journal where I try each day to write down things that I've seen the Lord do. I took that and I moved it from the end of my prayer list to the beginning of my prayer list. So the very first thing when I open my prayer list, and yes, my prayer list is on my phone, uh, the very first thing I have to do is scroll through all the things I've already written down that God's done in 2017. I got to scroll past those to get to where I write the next things. But then the second thing I did, and I wish I would have done this long ago. So the first heading on my prayer list is gratitude. And then after that, the next heading on my prayer list is just the word worship. There are no requests written under that. There's nothing written under that. It's just the heading worship. And what that does is before I jump right into requests, it stops me and it makes me ask the question, who is God? How is God worthy of my praise? One of the things I love about it is that sometimes when I can't think of what to write in the gratitude section, I'm just stuck. I go on to the worship section and it is not hard to think of reasons why God is worthy of worship. Even if I can't see it today, even if in the circumstances today, I'm feeling like I don't know what to write down in gratitude to the Lord. I mean, I know we could write down things in theory, like I'm grateful for the Bible and things like that, but that's not what I write in my gratitude journal. I write things that I've seen the Lord do, right? And so sometimes I come to that section and I can't think of anything to write and I hate that feeling. But then I go right on to worship and I say, yeah, but who is he? And you can always worship. 
And what I'm saying is, I wish I would have added that word to my prayer journal a long time ago. I should have. Gratitude, worship. When you're waiting on God, watch out for the tendency of your heart to set worship aside. All right, back to Acts 1. Let's read Acts 1, verse 16. See, verse 15 says that Peter stood up and to speak. And Acts 1, 16, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. And then look down at verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So notice that in addition to worshiping and praying, the one other action we're told that they took came from the Bible. Peter led them to understand that the word of God prophesied about both the failure of and the replacement of Judas. So in verse 22, do you see the word must? One of these men must become with us? Why was that? Where did the must come from? It came from the Bible. Because of what the Bible says, we must take this action. Doesn't that sound like the way Christian living ought to work? Because of what the Bible says, because of the principles of the word, we must take this action. And this is so relevant when we are waiting. When we're waiting, we need the word. When we're waiting, we struggle with the question, Lord, is there something I'm supposed to be doing? Because we know that waiting in the biblical sense is more than just sitting around doing nothing while time passes. It is this confident expectation and seeking of the Lord. And so when we're waiting, we're we're thinking, Lord, is there something I'm supposed to be doing? And yet at the same time, we don't want to be like Abraham and Hagar. We don't want to be like Moses and the rock. We don't want to be like Saul offering the sacrifices because he couldn't wait for the prophet to get there. We don't want to run ahead and take over and try to fix things ourselves and try to control the situation with our own plan and our own way. So how how do we do what we're supposed to do without taking over in the flesh? And the answer is the principles of God's word. From, From the word comes the sense of, I must take this action. This is what the word, the principles of God's truth are 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 directing me to do. So while we're waiting, we need the word. Without it, our minds will wander off in all kinds of unhealthy directions. Self-pity, shame, frustration, anger, guilt, excuses. Uh, we, we need the word to cut in to the middle of the swirl of our lives. Uh, sometimes on, the, on our counter in our bathroom, you'll find these little folded up pieces of paper with verses on them. They're the ones my wife has written down from her Bible reading and stuck in her pocket to carry with her through the day. And I'm not saying that either Crystal nor I is a good example of this, of letting the word of Christ dwell richly within us. But the point is that one way or another, you need the word in your pocket all the time. The word needs to be able to cut in and intercept your thinking. I think of it like a child, uh, one of my kids on one of those pieces of playground equipment that, that spins around and then they, you know, they... They, they angle those things so that your own body momentum like keeps you spinning or even gets you spinning faster, you know? And so I, I've had many of these moments with one of our girls on one of those things where they're like, Daddy, stop me! <laughs> you know, it's just out of control and you hope you're strong enough to throw your body weight in there and uh, get them to stop spinning. But our thoughts are like that. They start spinning and the momentum just keeps them spinning even faster. And what grabs us and stops us is the word. That's what allows us to see his perspectives instead of just being stuck, dizzy with the world spinning in our own thinking. When his word stops us, we start to see clearly. 
So when you're waiting on God, you need the word in your pocket all the time. You need God's truth in your ear. You need God's wisdom soaking your heart. Don't neglect the word when you're waiting. And that leads us right to number five. Look with me in Acts 1 at verses 23 through 26. Watch these words carefully. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. <clears throat> okay, I'm just, I'll just tell you what goes in that blank now so I don't forget. The word is dependence. I'm afraid I'll forget if I don't tell you now. Wait in dependence, number five. But let me back up and explain that because those verses may not look like dependence. Casting lots uh, wasn't voting. <laughs> Casting lots was something like flipping a coin. Probably involved taking two stones to represent two, two parts of a choice, putting them in a container, shaking them to see which one came out first. So it was very much like flipping a coin today. Now, this is not something we expected to find in Acts. It surprises us, it maybe confuses us, and probably the first question that comes to mind is, does this mean that we should be making decisions by casting lots? Remember, we set out a set of principles a few weeks ago for applying the book of Acts to ourselves, and when we applied, we applied those principles to this passage and saw that we're not supposed to be casting lots to make decisions today now that we've received the Spirit. But casting lots was not an unusual thing for ancient Israel. There are about a dozen passages in the Old Testament that describe this, some of which seem to describe it positively as if it was what God intended for them to be doing. It was one of the ways in which God chose to lead ancient Israel. And there's even a very familiar verse in Proverbs that refers directly to this, right? Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Now we we take from that the principle that God is sovereign over all things, which is true, but I think that the original statement may have been an expression of confidence that God was going to direct his people when they cast lots appropriately, that God was using that. Now, today we have the word and the spirit and the promises of God which are sufficient, and once the spirit came, there's no indication of anything like casting lots to discern God's will. But then does it not apply it, does this have any meaning for us? And um, the way to get to the meaning is to ask the question, why were they casting lots? And verse 24 tells us, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen. How else could they have picked the 12th apostle? A personality inventory. <laughs> Take a test. Let's find out if you're a good fit for this. They could have taken a congregational vote, which is what they did with deacons later. There are lots of ways they could have tried to discern who should be the other apostle, but what they wanted was to not lean on their own understanding, not depend on their own sense of what was best, but they wanted to know who God had chosen. And so the principle here is that we want to wait in dependence. We're not going to cast lots like them, but we need to depend like them. And I think we express this dependence when we pray something like, Lord, I don't want my own way. Do you pray that? Lord, I don't want what seems right to me. There's a way that seems right to man. The ends of it are just the ways of death. So Lord, I don't want what makes sense to me. I don't want what seems right to me. I would just want your way. And though casting lots seems strange, they were doing that because they wanted God's way, not what they could figure out on their own. So these first disciples remind us to depend on God, humbling ourselves to seek only his way. And, and see go, if we go back to like the Abraham story or the Saul story or the Moses story, when they were waiting and then they stepped in in the flesh, what did they decide? They decided they had a way to accomplish God's purposes. And it didn't require them to, to look to him any longer. They could do it their own way. So let us wait on him. And when we say, Lord, I'm waiting, I'm tired, Lord, how long? We say, Lord, not my way, but yours. Not my will, but yours. 
So there we've packaged together those five things. And I, I'm not sure we expected to find a package like that at the end of Acts 1. I doubt that if we were suffering and in a deep trial and struggling and our faith was under fire, I, I'm, I'm not sure the end of Acts 1 would be the first place we'd go to in our Bible. And yet we find here a group of, uh, of baby Christians in some senses waiting on the Lord in a difficult situation and we find this beautiful picture of spiritual health. Prayer, the word, worship, gathering together while we depend on God. Is Christianity that simple? How'd they get these basics down so fast? Jesus taught them. He'd been preparing them for these moments when he left. So, for better or worse, this song came to mind this morning. Give me that old-time religion. It was good for fathers. Okay, now, that, that theme is bad if what you mean by that is, let's do the traditions that have always been done in our whatever, right? That, that's not what we want. That theme is good if what we mean is, let's go back to what Jesus taught his very first followers were the essentials of a healthy spiritual life. Then let's go back to that. Now there are people today that are into ancient Christianity. They want candles, cathedrals, liturgy, robes. They want it to feel old so that it feels authentic. You know what is authentic and old? Read your Bible, pray, gather, worship, depend. And yet of those five things, do you struggle with neglecting some of those on a regular basis? Aren't those the very things that we let drop? Sometimes, man, we're holding on to this part of our Christianity, that part of our Christianity. I'm not gonna, not gonna dress this immodest way. I'm not gonna watch this thing I shouldn't watch. But I'll skip reading my Bible for a few days. Now, we need to get some old-time religion back when we're doing that, Right? We need to get back to the basics of what Jesus called us to do. And when we're waiting, as we are so often, oh, how we need these things. Pray, worship, listen to the word, gather, depend. It's a beautiful picture that got them ready for all those new babies that were coming. So what's God getting us ready for? Not Pentecost, Pentecost itself will never be repeated. But isn't God always getting us ready for the next things he's going to do? Isn't God always preparing us? So we don't know what's ahead. We just know that if we want to be ready for what's ahead, this is the way to do it. And this is the way to stay close to Jesus. So let's stay close to him.